Hello. Can you see my can you see my screen? Okay, let's start. <clears throat> Okay, before we start, uh, is there any question from last time? Okay, so let's start a new topic called decidability. And for this topic, we would need to, I mean, revise few things that we have done so far. And um, okay, so let's start. So you remember that whenever we define a Turing machine, There are two possibilities, either that this machine will say yes, or it will say no, right? Yes corresponds to accept the string, and no corresponds to reject the string, right? But there's also a third possibility, and that third possibility says that some Turing machines go into an infinite, Right. <clears throat> so, based on this information and our understanding from Turing machines, we define two things. So, we come up with a definition called, uh, so we say that suppose we have a language. So we say that a language L is called. Turing recognizable some Turing machine recognizes. And based on it, we have another definition. We say that a language L is called. Turing decided. The sum Turing machine decides. Okay, so we here the the keywords are Turing decidable. Turing recognizable, recognizes, and decides. <clears throat> right? So we already, I mean, we are all familiar with this, uh, these two definitions. Uh, so we say that, so based on these two definitions, um, so sometimes you call Turing machine a recognizer. Sometimes we have a Turing machine, we say it's a recognizer. Sometimes we have a Turing machine, we say it's a decider. Okay. And whenever we say that it's a decider, it means that Turing machine halts, that it stops on all inputs. 
means it may not stop on all right so this is the definition or the difference between these two kinds of turing machines so when you say a turing machine is a recognizer then it means that it may not stop on all inputs when we say turing machine is a decider it means it halts on every input every input that is possible that we can send to the machine it stops on those inputs is this thing clear to everyone before we move on okay so in 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 this chapter number 4 that is from the book and everything that you will do in uh, in today's lecture and in the in few more lectures that we will see uh we would be interested in proving that certain sets are decidable or not decidable so we would be interested in proving that certain sets and when we say certain sets it means that sets of strings okay and we, when we say sets of string strings it means languages that certain languages are decidable or not decidable and from previous uh, lectures uh, understanding we know that languages do not just mean languages which are just sets of strings in fact we can convert many computation almost all computation problems into a form of a language and then we can answer the question using a constructing a turing machine so when we say that set of strings or a language it doesn't mean just a set of strings or languages it means the underlying computational problem so these languages are basically computational is this in clear to all any questions any questions okay so let's go so the first kind of problem that we uh can tackle is called the acceptance so the first kind of computational problems or the problems for which we would talk about decidability are are represented or called the acceptance problems or the class of acceptance acceptance problems okay and whenever we talk about acceptance problem we would represent a, an accepting problem with a capital letter a and we would have a subscript here uh that subscript will tell us the specifics about a, about uh, the problem itself okay so the first problem that we tackle today <clears throat> score the acceptance of acceptance for dfx okay so what we really need to know so this acceptance of df acceptance for dfx means that 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 if i if i give you 
a certain a particular deterministic finite automata. Let's say I give you a finite automata uh, DFA. Imagine that that <clears throat> M is a finite automata, okay? Or let's call it B because B would be used several times. Suppose B is a finite automata, okay? So the question is, given this finite automata, is it possible to know whether a string W, any particular string W is accepted by B or not. Okay, so, so let me define it formally. We say that A DFA, so this DFA is in subscript, is a language, okay? It's a language that is a set of strings that contains encodings for a deterministic finite automata and a string W such that, such that B is a DFA that set, okay? So as we been, as, as we saw in, in one of the examples last time uh, that that whenever we had a graph, we represented the this uh, we represented that if I include this G in, in these pointing uh, arrow uh, brackets, it means that we have some encoding of the graph G, right? The same thing over here. So suppose B is a DFA. Suppose suppose B is a DFA. Then this is the encoding <clears throat> Are you getting this? Is everyone with me on this? Uh, sorry, sir, I'm not following you. Could you please repeat the suppose B wall apart? Okay. So do you remember the encoding? You taught us in the last class, right? Yes. Uh, I couldn't attend that class. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I'm now that the graph or jagged the adjacent matrix or adjacent this way. So, what is encoding? I think we have talked about encoding in, in uh, about encoding before us, but encoding is just um, that you represent a certain idea, certain concept in a different form, right? So, you encode it. So encoding over here does not mean compression or it does not mean um, some encryption. It means that you, you change a form from one simple style to the other. For example, if I say that this is a graph. Okay. Suppose this is, um, this is node A, this is node B, this is node C, this is node D. Then we can represent this graph as adjacency matrix, suppose this is so we can represent this graph as an adjacency matrix A, B, C, D. We have A, B, C, D. Right? So the zero means that there is no edge. So all diagonal will be zeros. There is an edge from A to B and there is an edge from A to C, but there is no edge from A to Similarly, since uh, there is an edge to A to B, so there is an edge from B to A, no edge from B to C, but there is an edge from B to B. There is an edge from C to A, C to B, no, and C to B, one, B to A, no, B to B, yes, B to C, yes. So this is an adjacency matrix. Now, if I say that this adjacency matrix uh, represents a graph, or this is just one way of representing representing a graph, it's, it's not an incorrect, right? 
So if I give you this matrix or this graph, it means exactly the same thing. Now I can give you this matrix in this form that I have zero, then we have one, then one, then zero. Then, then let's say some uh, empty symbol. Then we have one, then zero, zero, one, then empty symbol, then one, zero, zero, uh, one, then empty symbol, zero, one, one, zero. Now, if I give you this long string, then this long string actually represents this matrix and that matrix actually represents this graph. Now I have converted a graph into a long strings of zeros and ones. And similarly, we can convert everything into a string of zeros and ones. For example, if you have some JPEG image, right? Suppose this is your JPEG image containing some picture or uh, some photo, right? Now we, we can view this photo on, on our computer screens or phone screens, uh, but this photo is represented on computer, on computer disk using long sequence of zeros and ones, right? It's a long sequence of zeros and ones. Now, this is the, um, this is the uh, responsibility of, of the machine or the program that is reading this file to represent these numbers, which are zeros and ones and interpret them in a fashion that it shows the picture. Now, suppose instead of this, so suppose there's this program, uh, which we call image viewer. And I send a JPEG file. It will show me the photo, right? Show picture. Right now, this JPEG file is nothing but a long sequence of zeros and ones. Now, suppose I create, I have some music file, some uh, audio file, which is stored in an MP3 format. Now, this MP3 format is also a long sequence of zeros and ones because these zeros and ones produce sound. But if I send this MP3 file, which is in zeros and ones, to this image viewer, will it show me anything? For this image viewer program, this means nothing. It means just some garbage, right? It means it's, it's a sequence of zeros and ones, but it is not any meaningful sequence of zeros. So it is the responsibility of the machine, the responsibility, responsibility of the program to understand the, the input that it receives and interpret in a, in a fashion that is meaningful. Now, this could be an image viewer, it could be some audio player, for example, uh, rather than doing exactly the same thing, uh, but in the opposite, for example, we have music player. Okay, if we, if we send the same MP3 file over here, it will play music, right? Whatever that is in the file will be played. If it is a song, if it is some other music, if it is some audio, it will play. But if I, if I, Put this J, JPG file, this JPEG file to this to this music player, it won't do anything, right? It will not understand it because it does the, the sequence of zeros and ones is not is not in a particular format. So even though both these files are just long sequences of zeros and ones, one is meaningful for, for one machine, but the other is not meaningful for the same, right? Same thing goes over here. So if I have a matrix, then this matrix, if, if I have this graph then I can convert this graph into a matrix and I can convert this matrix into a long sequence of zeros and ones. And I can use that long sequence of zeros and ones by a program which understands, which accepts that the input is in form of long, long sequence of zeros and one. And these zeros and one, uh, ones represent some graphs, represent some matrix which represents some graph. So, so it, is, it would be the responsibility of the program to read it properly and then interpret it properly, right? So this is exactly what we mean by encoding. So whenever we have a higher level description, so this graph is a higher level description, which is understandable to us, but not necessarily to the computer. So this JPEG file is understandable to the computer, but if I, instead of showing the picture, I just give you a sequence of zeros and ones, it's not understand, understandable to you, right? So we can only visualize the picture which is shown on the screen, and that is only meaningful to us. Similarly, uh, that audio file or this music file is, is understandable to us if it is played in a particular fashion, 
rather than if I'm just the long sequence of zeros and ones, right? So we humans can only interpret data in a higher level format, right? And that's why we have pictures and that's why we have audio and that's why we have symbols and, and, and things. Uh, but internally for computers, it's just sequence of zero and zero, right? So, so this is what we do. This is what we mean by encoding. So for example, if I say that D is a DFA, okay? It could be any DFA. Suppose this is the DFA uh, that starts with Q0 and suppose our sigma is, uh, let's say A and B. And uh, let's let's make it, uh, yeah, it's fine. It's A and B is fine. So if it says that if it reads A, it stays here. If it reads B, it goes to state Q1 and it keeps reading B and A. And this is our acceptance state. This is a very simple DFA, right? So in this DFA, we can find out what are the strings which are accepted by this DFA and what are the strings which are not accepted by the DFA. So this is string, this DFA accepts any strings which contain at least one B, right? If it contains more than one B, that's perfectly fine, but it should have at least one B. So it can have any number of A's, then it can have any number of B's, and then it can have any number of A, A's and B's. Right? This is the language, which is the language of this DFA. And based on this language, we know that A, B is accepted. So for example, if I say that the language is L, then we know that A, B is in the language. A, B, B is in the language. A, B, A is in the language. And so on and so forth. A, A is not in the language, right? Just A is not in the language. M, T is not in the language and so on. So we know that all those strings in which there is no B are not accepted by this DFA. So in order for any language or any string to be accepted by this DFA, it must have at least one B. Now, this is the higher level description of this DFA, which we can visualize it because we can see, um, see the machine and we know how it works. And we know that how to make it, how to, how to pass an input to this one, uh, this, this machine and so on. Now, the question is that if I say that, suppose B is a DFA, and I do not provide you any um, meaningful representation of this DFA. I just tell you that there exists a DFA. Then if I say such a thing that you know that there must exist some DFA and, put, and, and you know and you understand what a DFA is and how it works, what are its inputs and what are its outputs and how it works and how it goes from one state to the other and so on and so forth. So if I say that B is a DFA, then, then you know everything about DFS, right? Now, suppose B is a, is a DFA, then we know that some strings, suppose, so there must be some strings which are accepted by this DFA, and there must be some strings which are not accepted by this DFA, right? So whenever we have a DFA, our DFA will accept some strings sometimes, and it will accept, it will reject some strings other than, right? So whenever I, I give input some string W, to DFA, to DFA B, it will either be accepted or it will be rejected, right? So it will either be accepted or rejected. Now think about, so in mathematics, when we say that something is a DFA or something has some property without specifying what that thing is, it means that it is for every possible scenario, which is, which is which could be, right? So if I say that if B is just a DFA, it means that it could be any of the DFA possible. And since there are infinitely many regular languages, it means that I'm talking about infinitely many DFAs. So all possible DFA that could exist in this universe, we are talking about those DFA, right? So the question is that given any DFA, given any DFA, and a string W. So given any DFA and a string W, and since we cannot put a DFA inside a set, so we say that given any encoding of a DFA and a string W, okay, such that B is a DFA and W accepts W. So this, this becomes, so this encoding becomes a long 
string of zeros and ones, right? So whenever we have a DFA and we pair it with one of the strings that it accepts, it becomes one element of the set. So we call the set DFA. Now think about all the infinite DFAs and for all and all the infinite strings that those infinite DFAs accept, they will make a pair and that pair will be there. Now we know that there will be a lot, lot of many pairs of uh, DFAs and Ws, which are not in, in this set. Why? Because those DFAs do not accept comes from, right? Now we know that this DFA accepts this string, this string, this string. So encoding of this DFA with AB and encoding of this DFA with this string and encoding of this DFA and this string will be all the members of this, this set while the encoding of this DFA B and, and uh, this string is not here, encoding of this and this is not here, and encoding of this and this is not here and so on and so forth. So many elements, uh, many, uh, I mean, for every DFA, we will have infinitely many pairs and for in, in, in many infinitely many pairs which are not in the, in the set and many infinitely pairs which are in the set, right? Is this thing clear? Do you understand what this ADFA is? This is a huge set, right? It's, it's extremely big set. Is this thing clear to every one of you? Is it clear to all? Sir, so the elements of this set will be the pair of DFA and the strings it contains or accepts? Yes. Yes. Okay, sir. For Thank every you. string that a DFA accepts, it will create a pair with that string. And, it's, and, and, and we will have the encoding of that, uh, uh, that DFA and, and that string that it, it, it accepts. So even for one okay. simple DFA, you would have infinitely many elements which are in the set. And since there are infinitely many DFAs, so you can imagine there are infinitely many elements in this set, right? For every DFA, there are infinitely many uh, strings which, are, which, which the DFA can accept, right? Okay. So this is a huge Thank set. You. It's an extremely big set, and that's true. So let me write here. So the problem, okay? The problem of testing, now we look at, problem of testing whether a DFA D accept an input string W is same as as the problem of testing whether the encoding B and W is a member of the language ADA, right? Now, of course we say that ADFA is a, is a set, it's just a language, uh, by no means that we will create the set, right? It's, it's extremely difficult to create such a set because it contains infinitely many elements and we cannot create such a set in reality, right? It's impossible. So we said that such a set exists somewhere, right? hypothetically speaking. It's not hypothetically, it exists in mathematics, right? It exists somewhere. Now, if I say that if I have an arbitrary DFA, any DFA that I can imagine, okay? If I have any arbitrary DFA, then that arbitrary DFA will accept some strings and it will reject some strings. Right now, for any arbitrary DFA, I can give you a string, and I I can ask you this question: Will this string be accepted by this DFA or not? Right. So this question can be converted, or this this particular inquiry is exactly equivalent to asking whether the encoding of B with W, so this encoding B W, is a member of the language ADFA or not, right? So it is solving a small problem from a very large or a, from a very big perspective. 
right? Is this thing clear? Okay. So my result here, or the first result that we will have for our decidability is the language ADFA is a decidable language. This is our theorem, which means that ADFA is decidable. Now, can you prove it? Can you prove it? Uh, I think with the help of encoding, we can prove it. Like if any string is accepted accepted by any DFA, so it will be the member of the ADFA. Or else it will be get it rejected. No. So when we say that ADFA is decidable, it means that uh, so ADFA is a set, right? ADFA is a set. And I say it's a decidable language. It means that it must exist a Turing machine M such that if I send an input X and if X belongs to ADFA, it should accept. And if X does not belong to, if it belongs to ADFA, it should accept. And if it does not belong to ADFA, it should reject. Right? This is what we want. Accept and reject. So, I can, so the proof means that if you can, if I can show that such a Turing machine exists, and since I say it's the sites, it means that this Turing machine must stop on all possible inputs. It should never go into an infinite. So the question is, is it possible to construct such a Turing machine? How can we construct the steering machine here? So this steering machine M is, so the proof is that the steering machine M is basically, it will receive some input X, right? But whatever this input X is, this input must be an encoding of two things, right? So this M must receive receive BW, right? right? So we say that M is a Turing machine, which on input BW, so this BW is basically the same X that we have here, right? It will carry on two things. Step number one, since we are talking about regular languages and DFAs, so if, uh, if a language is accepted by a DFA, we can always construct a decidable uh, Turing machine for that, right? So what we would do, we would construct, so this Turing machine will construct another Turing machine, okay? That simulates the working of DFA B. Or if you say that you can, either do this or there is an alternate way. Simulate, since we are talking about Turing machine, so simulate the working of B somehow. Because this, this B, since in all information is given here and we are, we are talking about Turing machines, so Turing machines are very powerful. So they can uh, simulate the working of a DFA, simulate the working of DFA. And step number two, send W to our simulation, okay? Step number three, if our simulation accepts, then accept, reject, otherwise. This is our definition of the Turing machine. And since we show that such a Turing machine can be constructed, therefore, 
this theorem is correct. This is the proof that ADFA is a decidable language. Is, thing, is this thing clear to all? Yes, sir. Is it clear to every one of you? Sir, sir in the alternative step, uh, you said that we'll be simulating the working of B, the DFA, right? Yes. But in the first, you, you said that it will construct a Turing machine. So the Turing machine will also be having the same transition as the DFA? Inside no, no, it. I, it doesn't matter that how this simulation is constructed. So I, I gave you two, two possible ways. So inside M, uh, the Turing machine M may decide to construct a Turing machine or it may decide to construct a DFA. It doesn't matter. Because in, in any case, it, it, it has to be, it has to simulate the working of a DFA, right? So this working of a DFA can be simulated by a Turing machine. It can be simulated by um, an NFA. It can be simulated by a pushdown automata. It can be simulated by a Turing machine. It doesn't matter how it achieves. Or you can say that you can write a program. So this Turing machine can write a program internally in, in C language, which does exactly the same thing. Or it comes up, comes up, uh, comes up with, with an algorithm that simulates uh, the working of it. So it doesn't matter how it comes up with. But, but since sir, we're talking uh, about Turing machine and Turing machines are powerful, last time you saw just Turing pieces. So whatever that notion of algorithm is, is exactly the notion of, uh, of Turing machine. Yes. But sir, but we are, right? What, again? Repeat, I, I can't do it. We, we are checking uh, the working of B for the string W in the pair, yes. right? Yes. But sir, it can be possible that W is uh, rejected by a simulation of B in the DFA and can be accepted by the Turing machine. Is it possible? That's not a correct question. Uh, that doesn't make any sense over because we are simulating something, right? So we are simulating language of the dfa so we are we, oh. we would definitely not increase the power of course so we would simulate exactly the same thing we are not doing anything more than what this dfa could be. okay now okay of course thank you sir suppose you have a car that goes 200 kilometers per hour so i the question is does this car go 10 kilometers per hour of course it does. right we can simulate the speed of a bicycle and it can simulate the speed of a motorbike and it can simulate the speed of any normal car, but it can go even faster than that. But if we are simulating, we don't have to go beyond what we need to. Do you get it? Yes, sir. Okay. So from now onwards, whenever we have such uh, uh, questions of decidability, I will give you proof. Uh, but that proof would be shorter in a sense that because we already understand what it what it is required to be to include in the proof, right? So I have another language, and that language is ANFA. And that language is it's encoding of B and W. So this B is an NFA that accepts W. So my question is, is A is A and F A decidable? Is it decidable? Can you answer? So there are two possible answers. Yes, it is decidable. No, it is not decidable. If you say no, it is not decidable, then you have to show me why, where is this counter example? And if you say, yes, it is decidable, then you need to show me a proof of how it is decided or why it is decided. Yes. What is the answer? Is ANFA decidable or not? I think it's decidable. Is it decidable? Anyone who says no? Okay, 
Uh, can you tell me why it is decided? Uh, just because of the I cannot hear you. I think because B is an NFA that accepts W, that's why maybe this may be the reason. So when we prove in math and CS, we don't say maybe. So what could be a proof? So if I say that, for example, if it comes in exam, what would you write as a proof? Since we say it's, it's so for example, if I say that, yes, uh, yes, ANFA is decidable. So if I say something is decidable, it means that I should be come up, I should be able to come up with a Turing machine which decides it, right? So so we, we remember the length, uh, we remember the definition of decidable, right? A language is called decidable if some Turing machine decides it, right? So if I say ANFA is decidable, it means that I should be able to come up with a Turing machine which decides the language ANFA. So can you construct such a Turing machine? M, which decides ANFA? Yes, can anyone try to come up with a Turing machine? So there are some uh, uh, answers in private chat which talk about the, uh, the solution. Uh, they are correct, <clears throat> but can you come up with a form, more formal argument? Okay, so the answer is correct, and let me show share share you share with you what is the answer. Since we are talking about Turing machines, so if M is a Turing machine which can simulate the working of a DFA, it can also stimulate the working of an NFA, right? So inside this M, so we would say M is a Turing machine, and we would say on input DW step number one simulate. working of D, right? Send W to D, this one. If D accepts W, accept, reject, otherwise. This is the proof. So, Either you can come up with a proof this way, and you say that since, suppose, uh, so you say that ANFA is decidable, so this, this means there must exist a Turing machine M, which will decide ANFA, and that Turing machine M is, is like this. Or you can write it in words, and you say that, okay, we, we think that uh, because we know, we say that this, this language is decidable, so it means that we should be able to come up with a Turing machine M, uh, which will simulate the working of B, and that will send, uh, the string W to the B, and if uh, that uh, simulation returns except, then it, it says except, otherwise it says. So that's a proof. This, this, this is the proof that why uh, these languages are decided. Okay. So let's move on and let me write a couple more uh, languages. So another language is AREX. Okay. What is this language? This language is encoding of R and W, okay? Such that R is a regular expression that generates string W. So the question is, is AREX decidable? Is AREX decidable? Yes, anyone?
yes, it is decidable. Yes, the answer is yes. Therefore, we can convert it into a theorem. We say that A X is decidable. And how would you prove it? The, answer, the proof is very simple. So it means that we have a, so, so we can construct a machine M. Uh, so on input, RW, what we would do, what we would, what this machine would do. Construct an NFA and from, from R, right? Pass. Okay, uh, pass W to N. If N accepts W, accept. Okay. Right? Because we know that given any regular expression, we can always convert, we can always construct an NFA from a given regular expression. And we proved, we just proved in the previous theorem that the language ANFA is designable. So if I can convert a regular expression into an NFA, then I can use the result from ANFA. Since ANFA is decidable, and I can convert, um, I can convert a regular expression into uh, an NFA, this is, this is enough, right? So this is the proof. What is the other proof for this? The other proof is exactly the same. It's, it's even smaller and simpler. So we would say that <clears throat> given RW, construct an NFA N for R, okay? Then NW, can be tested from A and F. Since A and F is decidable, therefore for every possible N is decidable and this completes the proof. Okay, is this in clear? Okay, now we will stop at the acceptance and we would talk about a class of problems which are related to emptiness. Okay, so consider uh, suppose I have a DFA, okay, some DFA. So the question is that. Is it possible to know that this DFA accepts some language or it does not accept some language? For example, consider a DFA, a very simple DFA. It has just one state and it is like this. It does not matter what are the, uh, it does not matter what are the elements. Let's say it is A1, A2, A, K. How many elements we have, we say that And there is no accepting state here. So the question is, what are the strings which are accepted by this, uh, this machine, this, this DFA? So it has no accept state. So basically it accepts no string. So M does not accept anything. Right? Since it doesn't have any accept state, so it will not accept any string. So M does not accept anything. Or in other words, we say that L of M is empty set, right? L of M is empty set. What is M? M is the name of the machine. So this emptiness testing is exactly the same thing. We say that E 
DFA. So the emptiness for a DFA, it says that given encoding for any machine A, any DFA, A is a DFA. Okay. And the language of A is empty. Okay, the language of A is empty. So this is one possible, such possible DFA, which does not accept any string. And you can construct any DFA, which does not accept any language, depending on whatever sigma you have, right? So for example, uh, there's another possibility. So let's say Q1 and we say zero, it goes to uh, Q0 from Q1. And let's say from one, it goes to Q2 uh, from, it comes here, it goes here, and uh, let's say one here and zero here, but there is no accept state, no accept state. Right? There's no accept state. So this is again uh, a DFA which does not accept any string, right? So there could be infinitely many different DFAs which do not accept any language. So, so the question is that, is this language, is E DFA decidable? No, sir. No? Yes, because sir, sir, because it at any string, it cannot decide whether it will accept or not. So no Turing machine, I think, can be created for that. Okay. Anyone else? So it will never accept any string, right? It will only reject it. Yeah, so the question is, is EDFA decidable? The answer is yes or no. So some, some students said no. Is there anyone who says yes? So it, we have at least one vote for no. Any votes for yes? So I'm still confused, so I would say yes. I'm not exactly sure about this one. Anyone else? So there are some votes on chat, uh, would say yes. Anyone else? I'm, I'm more interested in no's. So if anyone who thinks it is no can speak. So the answer is yes, it is decidable. And why it is decidable? So let me show you why. So, so we can construct a Turing machine M such that on the input A, where A is a DFA, what we would do? We would create, so from this encoding, we would create this DFA. Okay? So from the encoding, we can create the DFA. From the DFA, we can create encoding. So it's, it's, it's a two-directional thing, right? It's one-to-one -one mapping. For every DFA, there's, a, there's an encoding. For every encoding, there's a DFA, right? If there is, uh, I mean, we, we can always go back and forth. So on input A, we would create a DFA. And from this DFA, DFA, we will start from the starting state. So for example, let's take this as an example. It's not a proof. This is just to show that how this argument will work. So what we would do, we will start from the starting state and we will mark the starting state. And then we will try to move along all the arrows that go out of the starting state. So there's one arrow that goes to Q1. So we, we will mark it. There's one arrow that goes to Q2. We will mark it, right? Now, we will keep doing it till we have all the arrows and all the states marked. So we moved along this arrow, we moved along this arrow. Now we can move along this arrow, but this state is already marked. We move along this arrow, but this state is already marked. This is already marked, this is already marked. Now there are no more arrows and no more states to mark. And once we finish this process, we will just check what are the states that have been marked. And if we find any accept state, which has been marked in this process, we would accept it. And if there is no, right? So if no except is marked, 
no except states is marked, then accept it. Otherwise, reject. You get it? Since in this process, we encountered Q0, we encountered Q1, we encountered Q2, and none of these states is an except state. Therefore, the language of this DFA is empty language because it does not accept any string. Therefore, the language is empty. Therefore, we just accept A, right? So we accept A. If we find a if we find an accept state here, we would reject it. And that's exactly what we wanted to find out with EDF. Clear? So is there any no answer, still no answer? Is there anyone who still thinks that no, it is not possible to decide EDF? Is there any, is there any confusion, still any confusion? Yes, anyone? No, sir. Okay, so I think we can stop here at this point and uh, uh, we can come back in 10, 15 minutes and continue our discussion. Okay, so let's all go for a break. And in 15 minutes time we'll come back. Okay. Okay. Okay, is everyone back? Okay, very good. Uh, let us start. Okay, any question before we proceed? <laughs> okay, so I think we are clear that why EDFA is decidable. <clears throat> so let me just list down all the languages that we have seen so far. So we saw ADFA, we saw ANFA, we saw AREX, and then we saw EDFA. Um, These are undecidable, yes. You said for EDFA we can make a uh, make a Turing machine which will check all the states one by one and then see at the end if, if there is any accept state or not. So uh, will it have to first simulate that DFA in order to check all the states? How else do you suggest that we can do? Sorry, sorry, I couldn't hear you. So how how else we can check? Yeah, that's exactly what I was confused. So first we have to simulate the T, uh, the DFA and then we will have to check, right? Yeah, exactly. So for example, so let's consider a very simple DFA. That does contain a, a exact state, but still the language is uh, empty. It doesn't matter what transitions we have, if there is no way we can reach to this except state, uh, we cannot figure out if the language is empty or not, right? Because there is no way we can enter into it. Therefore, the language must be empty. So that's why we have to simulate uh, this DFA before we can right? before we can come to this conclusion that uh, it is it is empty or not. <clears throat> Oh, sir. Okay, so now uh, we will we have an, we have another one which we call EQ. A for acceptance, E for emptiness, E for equality. So 
this language is EQ DMP. Okay. And this language is given as follows. <clears throat> it gets encoding for two DMPs, A and B. Okay. Let's try A and B are DFS. And language of A is same as language of B. Okay. So if for any two DFAs, if the languages are same, they are in this, this language. They are in the set EQ DFA. If the languages are different, they are not there. Right? Uh, so for example, we, we know we have seen our uh, seen in many different examples that. Even for very simple uh, languages, for very simple regular languages, it is possible to come up with different kinds of DFS. And they accept exactly the same language. And the reason is that we can simplify DFS in many different ways and we still get the same language. For example, look at this DFA. And um, there's another BFA, just that. Let's start a good example. How can I, what is a good example? Okay, and consider this DFA. <clears throat> no, this not there. Sir, how is the first one a DFA? It's not, it's not there. Now suppose this is the DFA and construct, consider this DFA. Uh, you can have any number of A's and B's. Have A, you can have B, So again, not a DFA. Anyway, I'm sorry, I cannot come up with an example right now. I will think about it later on. But anyway, so sorry for that. So the question is that given any two DFAs, we need to figure out if <clears throat> the language of first DFA is the same as the language of second DFA. So the question is, is EQ DFA decide. I think yes. Because Anyone who says no? Can... Yeah, can, can you prove why? Um, because I think we can simulate both the DFAs A and B, and then uh, if every string that is being accepted by the DFA A is being accepted by the DFA B, and every string that is rejected by uh, the DFA A is being rejected by the DFA B, then that means uh, the language of both of these DFAs is the same and then we should be accepting it. Um, that is okay. So there's one small problem. Can anyone detect the problem with this proof? Yes, can anyone, can anyone detect 
the problem with the proof. The problem is <clears throat> that A is a DFA, right? B is also a DFA. And we know that DFAs can accept infinitely long language, right? In languages which contain infinitely many strings. Now suppose the size, so, so we have A and we have B. So, so suppose the language of A and language of B are both infinite, right? So the language of A and language of B are both infinite. Now, since it, they contain infinite strings, and there are infinitely many strings which are in the language and there are infinitely many strings which are not in these languages, then in order to test if these machines accept exactly the same language, we need to enumerate all possible strings one by one and then send those strings one by one to these machines and wait forever because, because it is infinite. So we need to wait forever before we exhaustively test each and every possible string. And we know that the exhaustive search takes forever. And if it takes forever to give us an answer, this is no longer definable, but it is just during recognized one. So the answer to this question is still yes, but this is not the correct proof. So we need to think about something else. Yes, the answer is yes. EQDFA is decidable, but why? This is not why. You see the problem? Okay, so the proof is very simple actually. <clears throat> so A is a language. Sorry, A and B. Uh, suppose A is a DFA, B is a DFA. So there must be a language for this, this automaton A, and there must be a language for this automaton B. And we call this L of A. And we call this L of B, right? So we need to figure out if L of A is exactly as L of B, right? Then accept as reject. How can we do that? We can do it very simple and very simple. <clears throat> Think about this. Suppose a, L of A is a language. If we intersect L of A with the language of L of B and take, I mean, take the complement with this one and intersect with it and find the union with L of complement of L of A's intersect with, with L of B, what, what do we get? This is called symmetric difference. We receive a language we receive a language, L of C contains strings, okay? Sir, so won't this be empty? So L of C contains In strings which are accepted either A, or B, right? Not both. Okay, that's exactly what we want. So L of C contains a symmetric difference of all those. So, so, so see, L of A is a set that contains many strings, right? L of B is a set that contains many strings. So we construct L of C. C is some other machine. We do not know what that machine is. But, but the language of that machine is such that it contains all those things which are, which are either, in, either in this one or in this, one, but not in both. If something is here as well as here, we just exclude it. If something is here, but not here, then we include it. If something is here, but not here, we include it. So this is called symmetric difference. So the symmetric difference of the languages of uh, the languages generated by the BFA and the languages gen language generated by uh, automaton B is a language that contains all the strings which are either accepted by A, 
exclusively or by me exclusively, but not by both at the same time. Now, we have reduced the problem of EQDFA, finding whether EQDFA is decidable or not, to a different problem where we say is, is L of C empty? If we, if we prove that yes, L of C is empty, it means that the language of A is the same as the language of B. And if we say that L of C is not empty, it means that there are some strings in A which are not in B, or there are some strings in B which are not in A. In that case, that will imply that language of A is different from the language of B, which means that the DFA A is different from DFA B. Languages are the same. We get it? So how can we create a machine for that? Proof will say that F is a machine. Let's say F is a machine. Let's say on input on input A B, we would say construct a DFA C, okay, such as L of C is L of A intersection complement of L of C. Union with intersection uh, complement of L of A union intersection L of A. Okay, construct a DFAC such this way. Run. Uh, now we have to check using EDF. Okay, that is. That is, that is check if importing of C is in EDFA or not. Okay, if it says yes, then accept. If it says no, then this is the proof. Is this thing clear? Yes, sir. So I just wanted to ask in L of C, how is the intersection of L A and the complement of L B uh, not equal to an empty? Okay, so let's take a set X that contains, uh, let's say A, B, C, and D. Let's take a set that contains, uh, let's say take U, U is a universal set because we are talking about uh, Complements of the data universal set. This, this contains A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Okay. And this contains E, F, it contains E. Okay. It contains E, F, G. Okay, size of X is five, size of Y is five. So when we have finite sets, it's very easy to compare whether these two sets are equal or not. We, just, we can just compare the element, but okay, that's fine. So we can say we can construct a new set G. There is the X complement, X intersection complement Y, union X complement intersection Y. So let's find out. So what is X complement? Can you tell me what is X complement? So everything that is not included in X. F, G. Uh, it contains F and G. What is the Y complement? A, B, B C. C. Okay. So let's figure out this X intersection Y complement. A, B, C. A, B, and C. Um, sir, if X and Y are the equal, are, uh, sorry, the languages X and Y are equal, then the intersection will be empty, right? Yes, the intersection will be empty. Okay. <clears throat> okay, what is X complement? 
इंटरसेक्शन इंटरसेक्शन सो वी हैव टू लुक एट दिस स्टेट एंड वी हैव टू फाइंड आउट एफ नाउ लेट्स फाइंड आउट द यूनियन ऑफ दिस सिस्टम so the union of this set and this set would be we will give us a b c f g okay right so why do we get a because a is here and it is not a is in x and not in y therefore a is here b is also here because b is in x but not in y C is also here because C is in X but not in Y. F is here because F is in Y but not in X. And G is here because G is in Y and not in X. The only element that we got rid of are D and E. Okay. Why? Because D is in, is both in X and in Y. E is also in both X and Y. Therefore, E and D are ignored. They are not included. Now, if this set is If this set is empty, then we know that these two languages are exactly the same. If these two sets are not empty, then these languages are not uh, equal. Right? That's exactly what we want. This is not possible. Okay. Thank you. Fine. Uh, any other question? Okay, <clears throat> now we come again back to the question of A's. For this, I will not go into much detail about the proof. I will just give you an overview. So the language is: consider this A C F, which is uh, which consists of the pairs, which are G and W, such that G is a C F G. Okay, and G, uh, generates W. So the question is: Is A C F G decided? Yes. Okay. What is the proof? You say yes. If G is a CFG, then we can make a push-down derivative for it, right? Yes. And then we can simulate it. And then if uh, W is being accepted. Yeah. So the proof for this is little bit involved uh, since we do not cover Chomsky normal form, so we will not go into detail. But it's outline or the higher level interpretation of. The proof would be that given the gamma g, now we can convert it into a Chomsky normal form. Now, Chomsky normal form is a, is a, is a type of gamma where, where every CFG can be converted into a Chomsky normal form. So if c, if g is a CFG, we can convert it into a Chomsky normal form, and then from there we can list down all the derivations with a certain number of steps, and then we would relate this length of, of the string w, and we check that it's possible that w is in one. Derivations are not. If yes, then accept. No, then reject. Uh, an even higher level uh, description of this would be that from given C G construct push down automata and pass this W to that push down automata. If the push down automata accepts it, accept it. If it does not accept it, then reject. So it's a higher level proof. So we, I will not go into detail of the proof. Right. Uh, but this is. Um, This is actually decided. Okay. Similarly, there is another language uh, which, for which again we will not go into detail, and which is the ECFG. ECFG is that given a grammar, given encoding for some grammar G. Okay. So G is CFG. Okay. And we need to figure out if L of G is empty. So this is, I mean, this is little bit involved. We will not going to prove that why it is the case, uh, but this is a decide. Okay, this is a decidable. Language. 
Okay, and similarly, there's third thing, which is EQ, such that given two graphs, G and H, G and H are C of G's, and L of G is same as L of H. Now, we have to be very careful with this one because you cannot use the same kind of uh, technique that we use for DFAs, EQ DFA, but still, uh, this, is, <clears throat> this is decided. Sir, why can't we use the same technique for the last one? Uh, there is this little bit little difference, this one. Um, the problem is that if a language L is regular, let's say if L1 is regular, and if L2 is regular, then we know that L1 union L2, L1 intersection L2, and L1 complement are all regular. Okay? But the problem is that if I say that some language is, some language L1 is context-free language, and L2 is context-free language, and L1 union L2, L1 intersection L2, are CFGs, uh, context-free languages, but L1 complement or L2 complement are not CFG, CFAs. That's the problem. Since the complementation does not hold for context-free languages, we cannot use the same argument that we use for DFA. So one may, one may be tempted to use that one, but it's not possible. Okay. The complementation is not a part um, Context-free languages are not close under complementation. Anyway, <clears throat> so we considered so many languages. For example, for, for, um, we considered ADFA. Uh, then we considered ANFA. We considered A regs. We considered EDFA. EQ DFA. These are for regular languages, right? Then we can see for context free languages that ACFG. And then we have ECFG. And then we have EQCFG. These are for context free. So these are all decidable. These are all decidable. Okay, so we, I gave a proof for this, 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 and an outline of this proof, but not, no proof for these two things. And, and I, I would ask you to either accept me that uh, what I'm saying is right, or if you're interested, you can read the proof from the book. Okay. And you can get, uh, convince yourself that these are indeed I'm not going to cover these proofs because uh, because we did not cover some of the prerequisites to understand the proof. That's why I'm I'm leaving it. <clears throat> but we have to accept that they are uh, they are indeed decidable. So any questions so far in this context when we are doing this? Thing? Any idea, any question? No, sir. Okay. So we have a theorem here, one more result. And this result says that every context we language is decided.
Can you prove it? Yes. So the theorem is that every context field language is designed. Can you prove? Um, so it kind of proved the, for example, if you if you can make a PDF for the CFL and then simulate it and then accept every string that is being accepted by the PDA and then reject yes. every string that is being rejected. Yeah, this is one possible proof. That proof is that given a context field language A convert so create a PDA uh, for A and um, so if you can convert a PDA for A that means we can simulate A right so this is one possible answer that comes in our mind uh, first but this is not correct actually there's one one problem can anyone find a find a problem with this So the problem is the PDAs are by nature non-deterministic. Right? So once you have a PDA for some context free language, since PDAs are non-deterministic by nature, so if you convert that PDA into a Turing machine M, that Turing machine would be non-deterministic. That's fine. We can we know there is a result that every non-deterministic theory machine has an equivalent determinist. That's perfectly fine. But the problem is that whenever we have a non-deterministic theory machine, we know that the computation in a non-deterministic theory machine is a little bit different than the deterministic theory machine. That it just starts at the starting point and then it goes into different branches. Right? And once if we find a branch here which starts from the starting point and goes all the way to to accept, we say that the Turing machine accepts, right? But there is a possibility that when you are trying to simulate a PDA using a TM, then that TM will simulate all those branches. And some of these branches may never end, right? So if you try to simulate those branches, you will be stuck, your machine will be stuck forever in an environment. And if a machine goes to an infinite loop in any of these branches, it means that we are not deciding, we are recognized. Therefore, this is not the right idea. Okay, so what we should do? The idea is very simple. So <clears throat> we say that suppose A is a context field language. One good idea to suppose. Net A is context free language. Okay, if A is a context free language, uh, <clears throat> then design G then design G a context free grammar for A okay and once we have G we can import it with some string W we can store some string W and send it to this one, A uh, CFG. Let's say this is the X. So we just say, is X belong to there or not? The answer is yes, accept it. The answer is no, accept it. We already know that this is decidable. It can always produce an answer, either a yes answer or no answer. 
So for every possible strain <clears throat> that we have, it will either accept, reject, just this. And that will prove that every context group language is decided. Now, some may argue that we just check with check for some language A and its corresponding grammar G and one such X. Then how can we say based on this limited information that every context free language is decidable or not? Is this a question in your mind? Yes, sir, I was thinking about it. Yeah. If you're thinking, then it's fine. It's in the right direction, but, but we should not think in that way because because we did not specify which language. We did not specify which grammar for this language. We did not specify what W for that grammar. Since it is all arbitrary, if it works for any arbitrary language, then it should work for all language. So in mathematics, sometimes any means all. Okay, this is sometimes students, I mean, this is something where students make confusion. So. For example, in one of the exams, I don't remember which one, but in one of the exams I gave that a question contained the word uh, show that any something, uh, it was like this, uh, show some property. I don't know which property, I don't remember it. So some property. Uh, For any, and I had particular class of uh, objects. Yeah, something like that. And the student thought that since I said any, so they just came up with one example and say that it's, it's fine. But once we have any, this any in math means all, because I did not specify which one. So if I don't specify which one, it translates into universal quantification. Okay. That is the inverted A, universal quantification. So if I say for any or for all, it means the same thing most of the time in, in math. <clears throat> anyway, so since we did not specify which language, we said say any, right? Therefore, and any W, therefore it works for any, and then any means for all uh, context. Okay, uh, with this. Yes, any questions? It's all okay. good, thank you. Okay, with this, uh, with this we, we have a very simple result. And that result is that uh, we have regular languages. And I've shown this before as well, but let me write it here again. Then we have context-free languages. Okay, then we have decidable languages. And then we have Turing recognized. Okay. So the regular languages are at the, I mean, they are the most basic in the sense that they are contained within context three, which are themselves contained, contained within decidable languages. Not all decidable languages are context three, but all context three languages are decidable. So we can go in this way. All regular languages are context free, but not all context free languages are regular. All context free languages are decidable, but not all decidable languages are context free. All decidable languages are Turing recognizable, but not all Turing recognizable languages are decidable. Right? So, this is some hierarchy or the relationship among all classes languages. These are all, these are the relationships among. Uh, classes of languages. Okay. So with this picture, there is a natural question. Uh, is there anything outside here which is not even Turing recognized? Okay. Is, there, is there even a bigger circle outside Turing recognizable languages which contain some uh, languages which are not even Turing recognizable. 
and the answer is yes. So when we say that if something is decidable, it means we can construct a Turing machine, which will accept if if um, it, it, it will accept some string if that string belongs to the language, and it can reject if the string does not belong to the language. Right? Then we go one step ahead. We say Turing recognizable. That means uh, that if we have a language L and I give you some string X, if X belongs to the language, a Turing machine will say yes. But if X does not belong to the language, then I may never get an answer. Right? So it is just Turing recognized. So the question is, can can there be any language which is not even Turing recognized? That is, we cannot even construct a Turing machine which will say accept for some things and reject for something. So it, it cannot even answer anything. And the and the surprising answer is yes, there are languages which are not even Turing recognizable. And we will see at least one such example. Uh, we will see several such example which are where we we see languages which are just Turing recognizable. And we will see at least one such example where the language is not even Turing recognizable. And based on that, we will have even a surprising result. And we will see that all these languages which are here in, in which are which are here uh, within Turing recognizable form a set that contains languages. But all these languages which are outside this blue set is bigger. Even though we might think that maybe it's a smaller, there are just few cases, but no, it's not true. Uh, we will figure it out later. Okay, and that will actually start, for that we will start a topic which we call undecided. We will start talking about undecidability from Monday next week. Okay, so I think we can stop the lecture here. If, if you have any questions, let. Uh, so for quizzes, so we have so far done with quiz one and quiz two. I I have graded quiz two. I don't know how to show the result. So I'm not aware of the LMS, uh, which is an IDA. So I don't know how to post the grades. I asked IT to figure it out. Uh, but then I will figure it out. I will try to figure it out how myself and if it is possible, I will show you the grades by tonight or tomorrow or maybe in a couple of days before the next class. Quiz one still remain to be graded and I will grade them. Midterm also have to be graded. I have not graded midterm. Uh, it will take some time. So give me some time. Uh, the next quiz, uh, the next quiz, which is quiz number three, we, we will have this quiz number three on Thursday. How many quizzes there will be? Uh, there are at least five quizzes. So we will have a quiz number three on Thursday. And uh, yeah. And by that time, we will cover everything that we covered today uh, and yesterday, and we will what we will cover on Tuesday. Okay. Any questions? Um, sir, when will you post? When will you post the grades? Uh, I just said that I, I have to figure out how to post it. Post the grades. I've already graded, but I don't know how to post them. So. Can you try to submit to an element? Um, uh, that's. Two. But that's a little bit. I mean, difficult because then I have to do it individually, right? So I was trying to figure out a way where I can post the result. Uh, at one time when they go together to every student. So I don't know how to do that. I mean, at the IV LMS, so I, I'll try to figure it out and then I will post it. Sir, uh, do we have a uh, teacher assistant TA yes. for this yes. course? Yes, so we, we just found a TA for this course, which, which is too late. Uh, and that TA, I will announce the name of the TA in his office hours in next class. So still there are some official things pending about his um, uh, contract. So we will we will figure it out on Monday, and then I will post it. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, we might need some tutorials because we first use while solving the quizzes. I think I, the problem was that I I can. I understand everything in the lecture, 
I could solve uh, everything I can. I, I, I practiced, but in quiz, I, did, I, I didn't know what to do. I don't know. I, 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 I agree. didn't understand I agree. the question in I last quiz. And, uh, I agree. And the thing is that uh, for that, there is, there is no shortcut. Actually. So, so you need to practice a lot. And how can you practice? Try to solve the questions which are given at the end of the chapter as an exercise. So try to do as many questions as possible. Uh, try to do the problem sets that I provide and, and and think about it. And then you can discuss those problems with among your class fellows. And, and if you cannot come up with any answer, then you can also ask me and we'll sit down together and try to solve it. Uh, but there's no shortcut. So you need to do it yourself. Uh, me explaining or somebody else explaining one problem or two problems or ten problems uh, will just enable you to think solution of those specific problems but you will not learn how to do it yourself for any unknown problem. So I would suggest that you do it yourself, practice it, and whenever you are stuck, just let me know and we will figure out a way uh, to help you out. Okay? But you need to try first. You need to show me an effort that you need to show that you have put a sincere effort in understanding and solving before you, you came to me and uh, we figure it out together. But you need to put your efforts. Okay. I've already uh, posted the solution to quiz number two. I think you have seen it. Yes, sir. Have you seen the solution for uh, quiz number two? I have posted the solution for quiz number two. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So I've posted the solution to the quiz number two, so you can uh, see. So I think we can stop the lecture. Uh, if no more questions, then I would say thank you. I'll see you again on Tuesday. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, no, I cannot hear you. Okay. Uh, can we have another uh, set of practice questions? Yes, I will. Uh, I will give you i will provide you some practice questions for for turing machines and other things. sir yes sir in the solution of quiz two you have uh, given the answer in a descriptive form yes. for the question one but if someone solves it with the graphical form so will it be acceptable yes it is acceptable i have graded all uh, question number one in that format as well but there there are only few restrictions and that is your answer should be correct so oh. if your graphical representation is not correct, then you will not. Right? So it should be okay. correct. So okay. what, what I observed that some students forgot to mention which state is the starting state, right? Okay. okay. Which is not a correct idea, right? So every Turing machine has a specific starting state. And yes. then some students merge the concept of PDA with Turing machine, which is also not the right thing. So you lose marks. Okay, any other question? Sir, in QA machine, do we have to write an answer in descriptive form like you have done in question two? Yeah, from now onwards, you can write the answer. Uh, for example, if um, whenever a question asks for, uh, whenever a question asks to give a queuing machine or design a queuing machine, uh, you can either uh, draw a graphical representation or you come up with a descriptive form. Both of them are correct. And provided that their answer is correct. And that, that's, that's the precondition. Okay, Anything else? Okay, in that case, thank you very much. I'll see you on Tuesday. So have a nice day. Stay safe and positive. Thank you.